Who's got a question for any of our panel? My question is to, to Emma with regards to the chart that you, you put up around um, farm gate prices and, and uh, obviously the, the beef prices in terms of retail. Um, I guess within your co-op structures, how do you envisage getting better visibility on the cost associated with the, the downstream part of the process? The reason for my question is a lot of farmers think about value adding uh, but don't understand the associated costs added in doing so. So I guess the, the real chart for me is, is not so much the price you receive but the profit you make. And I'd just be interested in your thoughts about how to um, uh, work with the industry. And it was in the previous session we had just before lunch around better visibility and transparency um, so that you can derive where the profit is, not where the price is. Thanks for your question. Um, you know, I certainly don't have all the answers, but I'd just like to make a couple of points. Um, the model that we're looking at is being driven by the ground up. So it's, it's, it's looking at our, our cost of production and looking at how we can maximise our cost of production and how we can add value to the supply chain. So I guess that transparency in costs um, is a part of that. So us being clear on what our costs are and being able to talk about those and be transparent about what those costs are and being realistic in how we're adding value. So I think for that to be a reality, it's got to be about the relationship and it's got to be about how you're, how you're adding value to the supply chain. So, you know, how that happens would depend on where you're at with the relationship you have with the processor or the person doing the value adding, but I think it does cam come back to shared value and being able to drive that. Um, but I think, you know, we're realistic and that that's not how um, we currently do business, you know, there isn't a, a huge amount of transparency in the supply, ch supply chain around costs. So I guess that the first focus is us, for us is being realistic about our own cost of production and how we can maximise those through collaboration and then looking at how we can work with others in the supply chain to help them with their costs and vice versa. So, you know, it's not something that's going to happen overnight, um, but I think it's something that we're working towards and I think the better, better handle we have on our data and how we're adding value, the more leverage we can have with others about, um, you know, how we're, at, how, how we're enabling them, um, you know, th through what we're doing. And Emma, does, um, uh, I'm just caught up with uh, Mick Keogh at the ACCC, his report into the beef industry and um, push for transparency, I suppose, on the, more transparency on the processor's side. Uh, is that going to make a lot of difference for you, do you think? Probably not. Um, you know, I think processes will only be more transparent when there's value in them being more transparent. Um, I, I guess there can be laws around that. They can be made to do certain things. Um, but if you look at the US example, um, you know, there, there is sort of a lot of laws in, um, in the US to enable, um, you know, greater tr price transparency. And there's all sorts of stories around, you know, how useful that information is. So I think, I think the law and government can only do so much and, and uh, the other component of is, a, is, a, is about um, people working together and looking at how they're adding value to each other and through that relationship um, comes greater disclosure and more transparency around, around price. All right. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, Jenny O'Sullivan here. I'm just interested, it's fantastic to hear the innovation, whether it's through co-ops or digitally. I'm interested in how this innovation can lead to more regional development. You know, where you're in remote areas in Australia, the economic value of agriculture, but as we innovate, where are the opportunities for regional development? Come on. Yeah. I was just going to say, being a part of a small community, and we're very lucky in that regards because that is a real sense of community. I got tired of, of waiting, to be honest, um, and I saw an opportunity to put skin in the game and actually set up what I call myself a reference farm. Um, and I think if farmers or remote parts and communities want to to go ahead, it's about trying to take that first bait and partnering up with people that can give you the ability to do so, but actually putting skin on the game. Connectivity is a big issue, you know, if the NBN for me has been, I call it a bit of a disaster with respect to NBN, but it really should be for rural and remote people, um, but cities get it, the hills get it in Perth and, and it just 
backlogs the whole system. So not every grower, it's not a government responsibility to get in, you know, connectivity to my farm. But the idea that I've sort of had is that if you had a node that was local and I wanted to put skin in the game and put that investment to it, enable that technology on my farm, I would then pay that cost of going to the node. The sad reference is at the moment we don't really have those nodes. And I think you know, that's a real opportunity to connect rural with city and allow us to have some of those things. But you know, I'm a very big believer that if you want to go on ahead and succeed in life, you've got to take those risks and challenges. And because we're rural and remote, which has great advantages, but also has disadvantages, you've got to put the skin in the game and really sort of put yourself out there to try and make yourself you know, not as remote. But I always take the love of the rural, if, if that answers your question. The, the, the actual structure of a cooperative, presumably, if it works, will keep your smaller family farms going. Now, that must in itself add to um, keeping regional areas, uh, a lot of rural areas alive, would it not? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think that's what's great about the cooperative model is it can work on all sorts of scale. Um, you know, so you've got the, you know, the largest cooperative in Australia, you know, CBH, or you can have a small community preschool cooperative, or, you know, it can, do, it can work on so many levels. Um, it's about um, sh shared meaning, you know, sh a compelling need and, and the ability to drive shared value. And I think, um, you know, by us being innovative on farm and and and, and driving profitability, um, you know that the flow on from that f for our communities and and for our regions is is there. So I think our approach is is similar to what Darren's saying: is not waiting for others to do it for us, but rather looking at ways at how we can we can drive that opportunity ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think you know that, that there probably is a bit of mentality, cultural, and you know, in the bush, you know, waiting for someone to blame, waiting for someone to, to, mm. to do to do it for us. But I think the idea is, if it's going to work, it's going to work because we're going to make it work. Um, sort of not waiting for for others to come in uh, and make it happen. Jim uh, Bradley, Charles State University. Um, to Darren, three quick ones. One is, uh, are other farmers around copying what you've done? Secondly, if the NBN came, would you use it? And the third is, if everybody does this, what are the community spin-offs? Uh, the NBN, I, I ran across when I spoke a while back now at a certain conference, and I went up and said, oh, I'd like to know if the NBN's available at our place. And not being rude to NBN, but they couldn't even find my road. We were supposed to get fibre to the premise in Minanew or thereabouts. We rang and they couldn't, they couldn't do it. And to be honest, the amount of data that I'm going to pull down and, and use, and I need that speed, NBN doesn't allow that for me to, to utilise that technology. And a number of problems that we've had locally with the guys that have actually got onto NBN, they all have got wind of what I'm doing and wanted to know whether I can build them into the network. Um, I could make my Wi-Fi network available to others. Um, it's been discussed and we're going down that road to have a look at. What was the other question? Oh, whether other farmers are following your lead. Um, we're probably a little bit unique and I was very lucky to partner up with Annie. Um, but rest assured, there's a fair bit of chatter around the district what these towers are and where they are and what they're doing and they, everyone is keen as mustard. But as I said before, growers are very conservative people. Um, you can talk the talk, walk the walk, all that sort of caper. But it has to be real, it has to be relative and hit the ground. And I've spoken at a few of these things and the guys say, well, you know, we want to come and have a look. So they want to see it, they want to see it in action, they want to see... And for me, it's like a bolt-on. They, they get a bit... Um, not scared, because it's, it's new. I said, did you like a culture be as simple as just having a rain gauge in the backyard, one rain gauge? You can then go to one moisture probe. So you can bolt things on. You don't have to have the Rolls-Royce of the system. But no, it's, it's certainly... Big data for me doesn't really mean a lot in some regards. It's more about the digital agriculture and making tools and making more effective use of those tools. Yeah. Terrific. Tom, one, one for you. Um, your graph that you put up from, from the survey, which you said surprised you, which is in good times, the difference between good and bad farming um, and, and how the, the, the less successful farmers spent up and how that was 
Is that right? Did I get the yeah, right end of the street? that's right. Um, so that is, that's rather different then from, say, um, farmers who would do exactly that with um, temporary water because uh, when water's cheap, you just go spend, 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 and you're making lots of money because the level of spending, obviously, it's, it's, it's worth it. Whereas you're saying the sort of spends that they were doing was simply not efficient for them in terms of the profits they were getting. Well, so I'd say in, in this case, this was broad acre cropping, so there's no irrigation in, in, yeah. in play here. And what we were really looking at was things like fertiliser and, and chemical use. So, yeah, what, what it was showing was that for, for those um, people that were previously applying sort of relatively low level of inputs, suddenly changing your system and applying a whole lot of inputs because it's rained a lot more wasn't necessarily helping them or wasn't necessarily as beneficial for them as, as it was, as applying those same inputs was for the guys that were doing it consistently and had a, a, a different production system. So I, I, I suppose the message from that was that um, the, the use of inputs you know, does change over time, but it shouldn't necessarily throw your whole system out because the weather's changed. Yeah, yeah. And Emma, um, one of the things that came up in the session just before uh, on cooperatives was that uh, when it came to spending up on things like data and data mining and that sort of thing, that it was the old problem that the cooperative had that they didn't, because they were small, have the capital to invest in the future. Do you think you're going to come up against that sort of challenge? I guess it comes back to, to the value that you, you're able to generate um, and, and, you know, and, the, and the value in, in, in that data. But I think the important point from that session this morning that it wasn't just in um, you know, technology and um, big data sets, it was in the value of farmer knowledge. And a lot of that is tacit, and a, but, it, but it is highly valuable. And I think you know, producers working more collaboratively um, you know, can leverage a lot of that knowledge that, that um, we, all, we all know is out there, but it just needs to be coordinated in a bit more of a, a standardised approach. So I don't think it's necessarily about huge data sets and, and um, you know, great exa you know, huge examples of connectivity, but even at a regional level, you know, utilising that knowledge and standardising systems and processes in a more coordinated way. Mm. Right. Hello, of the room? Yeah. Uh, one mic. Uh, could trail it back that way, that'd be great. And there's one mic, there's a lady here, actually. Yeah, David Campbell, Agribusiness Freelance. Question for Emma. Um, processes, um, you mentioned processes a fair bit in your presentation and you talked about shared value and collaboration. I mean, processes have uh, some real issues around continuity of supply, return on their capital investment and their, and their cost base, particularly if they're buying the stock, not just processing on a contract. And um, we're seeing that in the lamb industry right now with, with shutdowns, for example. Um, so taking your model, the cooperative model, and I'm a great supporter of cooperatives, um, how do you address some of these shared value issues in tangible terms? What are some of the levers that you could pull as a cooperative that individual producers wouldn't be able to do, such that you can collaboratively address those issues that processes face that affect the trading relationship you have with them? Uh, you know, what are some of the tangible things that a cooperative could do that individual producers on their own wouldn't be able to do? Well, I think the first one today is about numbers. It's about volume and continuity. And I think that's a real, um, we have, there's some real leverage around that at the moment, given the short supply that we currently have. And then from the, the other one that goes with that is, is um, quality and consistency, being able to deliver what you promise, you know, day in, day out. Um, and then I think I, you know, I talked about a range of other benefits that I think things like you know, efficiency in the supply chain, you know, reducing you know, selling costs, being able to reduce, you know, improve um, transport efficiency, being able to improve processing efficiency. And then on top of that, some higher value um, aspects like you know, the, the transparency, the story, the branding, the provenance. Um, but I think the, you know, the first two, the most important two, are being able to have volume. Um, so scale and continuity around that volume and then the consistency of what you're delivering. Um, and I guess I just make the point that, you know, I think there are a lot of producers out there that uh, are looking at, you know, branding their own product and, and cost custom killing. And I, there's also a lot of, um, you know, 
particularly Chinese investors <laughs> looking for, you know, looking to work with supply groups. And I think, you know, those are obviously great opportunities, but I also think there's an opportunity in, in just working differently with our existing processes and looking for where we can get some shared value um, rather than sort of going out and trying to do everything our, ourselves, which is obviously not an easy, you know, an easy strategy. What about the tricky issue of how you share the risk and the arbitrage, um, which we've seen in other agricultural industries where producers and downstream players have been able to develop some relationship of sharing that? Um, what, would, what would be required in, in your industry for that to be applied? Because that seems to me to be one of the big tricky issues so that you, you can do this over time, not just at specific points in time. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and it's not the way we traditionally operate. So, it, you know, there is going to be some hurdles to overcome there. Um, but I guess we've, we've got a, a shared interest in making it work and that processes need cattle coming through the door. They need quality cattle coming through the door. Um, and, and, you know, we're the ones that can supply that. Producers are the ones that, you know, have got the cattle. So I guess they can either, processors can either, you know, choose to own more of their own cattle and have more of a captured supply, or they can look at how they work um, differently with, with producers. And they're doing that anyway. You know, there's more uh, processor-driven supply groups. So that's the other model, is processors driving that opportunity back down the chain, but the producer's still simply selling an animal. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, taking a price on that animal. Um, so they're the big questions that, you know, that need to be worked through and there's no easy answer. But the, my point is if producers did nothing more than coordinated with other producers and looked at how they can get leverage just at a, at a farm gate level, they'd probably, you know, be 20, 30 per cent uh, capacity there in terms of, um, you know, extra efficiency and extra return just did doing that. Um, you know, disregarding the price that we might get on that animal, so that there's a huge opportunity in producers thinking about how they can leverage from each other, and then looking at how that that value can can drive down the supply chain. Um, and I think, you know, I think processors are going to have to think differently about how they work with producers. I think that's that's the reality. Um, so there's, you know, they're going to have to think about how, you know, how they how they do that. And there's going to be some processes that do that, that, get, that, that um, you know, there are processes out there now that work differently with producers. Um, um, so I think you know there are already people out there kind of doing that. Uh, Anna Spear from Auctions Plus. Sorry, Emma, another one for you. Um, I, I'm really inspired with what you're doing and the evolution that you're working through with the co-op process. Um, and I really like the idea around getting beef producers closer to the supply chain um, and moving away from spot pricing. A question for you. I, I see the benefits in spot pricing and taking the volatility out of our market and working on both ends of the supply chain. In your mind, what are some of the roadblockers as to why we don't see more uptake of forward contracts or forward pricing? Because currently there's very limited forward pricing visibility in Australia. Probably a lot of it comes back to, you know, the management approach of, of the producer and the way that we've traditionally run our businesses and being quite independent um, taking a, you know, having a lot of flexibility in the way we make our decisions. Um, and I guess with that comes, um, yeah, greater flexibility, greater freedom. Um, you can tell yourself a better story about why you haven't done something or why you have, and no one else sort of needs to know. Um, so, it's, so it's a cultural aspect to that. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, it is going to be, it is going to be a shift. Um, but I think, and it's probably also about, you know, people not knowing what their cost of production is. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of that still out there, that people don't know what their costs are, so they don't know what they're gaining or losing on, on, on when they're selling. So they're mes less likely to, to take, um, you know, a, a contract um, because it may, you know, the price might go up. Um, so I think it's probably a cultural thing. But, you know, and let's be clear, there's not a lot of tools for small producers in, in forward pricing in Australia. I mean, you, you can't get contracts, you know, at a small scale. Um, so does, that, does that put you at a disadvantage to large um, players in the beef market? Oh, absolutely. It, it, um, it means we, you know, we have less, we, we're taking bigger risks because we can't, you know, we can't forward contract it at a, at a, at a small level. Um, we don't have futures, cattle futures, like they do in the US. Um, so we are literally taking that spot price and, and hoping that you know things are going to go the right way. Um, yeah, so it is a risk. 
goes back to your value add proposition, really, is what yep. you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Christiana Spitzer, probably at the top. Uh, there's a well known uh, farmer saying, said by a litre of vino, a golfer, the more a farmer, the luckier I get. Um, you mentioned farmer luck in your talk and management. Are you convinced management is the difference, or is it luck, or can you actually tease out the difference between luck and management in teasing out the yeah, so look, I think the person that said the more the farmer the luckier they get was probably onto something. That there's there's sort of there's absolutely luck and management are what drive the results we see. I guess we can't interview at an individual level say, oh yep, that was definitely good management that year and the next year you got lucky or you got unlucky. So they're, they're, that's a limitation of our of, of our survey, I, I guess. Um, what we do know, though, is that there are some farms that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> consistently perform better than others, and so we can look at those farms and compare them with other farms and try and say, okay, what are the differences between these farms? And when we do that, that's when we run into this issue that you know the the standard sort of economic human capital model says, well, your education should be a predictor, your maybe your experience farming should be a predictor, and they're not great predictors at all. There's the, the sort of um, coefficients that we get in, in regressions aren't really that strong. So that, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's all luck. It just means probably that we can't measure relevant experience and we can't measure relevant education perhaps quite as well as, as we'd like to. If you get it right, Daniel Carmen would say you'll probably get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> That's probably right. People have been trying for a long time and haven't found it yet. So. Chris, if I could just add to that, I've now farmed 20, or well, coming up to my 20th crop, and I don't think I've had one year that has been the same as the other. They've been similar, but none have been in. And I'll tell you what, when you're broad acre and you're not irrigated, there is a fair bit of element of luck where the rain's going to fall, even if, you know, depending on, on your own farm from top end to bottom end. You might be in a solid area, but there's still that little bit of element of luck. Well, can I, can I fit, oh, one there, sir, yep. Yeah, Darren, at one point you said you uh, came across, how do you, at one stage you said you came across this uh, Norwegian Wi-Fi expert, and then a bit later on you said as long as it's open, open you can get a programmer to implement your idea. Uh, how hard is it to uh, find innovations or be innovative as a farmer, as a primary producer? Um, I suppose it comes back to your element of risk. But, and your risk profile, how much you want to put out there to try something out. Um, and the way I, I probably I, I missed an opportunity there, how I actually Annie came across my path and, and hers, I'd sort of been involved, and I'm a very big advocate of adding back to industry, so that's why I've sit on the Western panel and I've had a bit to do with, with CBH. Um, and I suppose it then comes back to a little bit about profile. Annie had heard me that I was doing something with drones and she sort of sourced me out and approached the Midwest Development Corporation. She had to have this idea and they said, do you know any growers that is involved in this? And they said, oh, this is bloke down at Mini News a bit mad. Try giving him a ring. And then when we spoke, we had this understanding and, you know, she suddenly realised, and Annie's very big on um, transparency, um, trust and all that sort of stuff, which are really good business principles um, when you're working in a partnership. But with open source, and he's very big, an advocate of having that open source ability so you're not locked in, and that gives you that interoperability perspective by not paying a software locking into a program. So if you, by the way, if the use of APIs and all that sort of stuff and making it interoperable, that little Origo box, it's an open source thing, so anybody can get into it, but you need certain protocols to activate it, etc. But it's, you're not locked into any fixed price contracts, any soft paying a six or a thousand dollars a year for this program, and that's where that open source sort of thing comes back through. And you know, you can have things open source and just sends a little signal, and as long as you're reading the same lines, it, you can make use of that data. Well, on, on that note, Darren, I, I think I, I will close it. It was absolutely fantastic to hear both of, of your stories. A lot of fun and a lot of hard work, I think. Thank you. And thank you to Tom as well. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.